in exposing and expelling strongholds. This is session number one. This ministry that you came to this weekend, can you hear me okay, is not a Band-Aid ministry. It's like you have a sore, we don't put a Band-Aid on it, we get rid of the wound. And that's what makes it different. Now another thing that we don't do is we don't pray deliverance at an altar area. Um, do you know what I mean by altar area? Someone asked me the other day, what do you mean by altar? You know, when, at the end of the service, a lot of churches, they have the people come up for prayer, for uh, maybe salvation, maybe for uh, financial needs or whatever. That area of a church is usually very anointed. Now then, Let's say that um, someone, Mary, I'll pick on her. I know her name up here. Okay, let's say Mary came up for prayer, and I'm an altar counselor. And I go over, and I see Mary, and she's kind of doing like this, and she won't look at me. And I recognize right away that she has a spirit of fear. Now, I could say, you spirit of fear in Mary, I command you to leave right now in Jesus' name. And guess what? It would go. It would go for two reasons. Number one, my authority. The God Almighty in me made every devil and, and Satan himself. Every devil there is. God made them. And they have to bow at the God in you. So because of my authority, it would leave. And also because of the anointing. They don't like the anointing. And if any of you are from churches where they have uh, a lot of, um, you know, prayer at the end of the church uh, service, you'll notice that a lot of times demons will manifest. And it's it, people will start carrying on and maybe fall down and do all kinds of things. It's because of the anointing. They don't like that. But you see, the problem is I could pray for Mary and that demon spirit would leave. And then Mary goes out to her car, gets in her car to go home that night, and picks it right back up again. You see, we have found uh, Satan is a legalist. And if he has a legal right to be in your life, you, he, would, he can go and come. The reason that we take our time and do some counseling with you before we ever pray deliverance is because... We want, when we pray deliverance and the demon leaves, we don't want it to ever come back again. We only want to help people. We don't want to hurt anyone. And uh, if we're in a visiting church and we're under someone's authority and the pastor asks us to pray deliverance for someone in the altar area, we'll do it because we're under his authority. And, of course, you know, we wouldn't. Uh, or even think not to do it, but we don't like to, we don't want to, and it certainly isn't going to do that person that much good. You need to find out why does the devil have a, quote, legal right to be messing with you, to be tormenting you, to be hindering you, to whatever your problem is. There's a reason that he has a right to do that. And, and this week in, we're going to find out what that reason is. We're going to shut that door up tight. Then we're going to pray for you on Saturday and that devil is our devils are not going to come back. So whatever you're sitting here with, if it's depression, if it's rejection, if it's fear, it'll go. It will go on Saturday. This ministry works, and it always works. It's just amazing. You know, uh, I had a girl call me today from Boston that's been through our ministry, and she read an article in the newspaper about um, uh, the Catholic Church and and how they do deliverance, and that it, there was only a handful of people in the whole nation that is allowed to do it, and and that uh, uh, oh all of the and it takes months and months, and they're reading scriptures and rituals over you and that. And she said, you know what I did? I called the New York Times and I called the man that wrote the article, and I was telling him about you. <laughs> so it, this does work. It works all the time and it doesn't have to take a lot of time. All you have to do is find out why is the devil there and then shut that door up and kick him out. <clears throat> Two things have to happen though for it to really work. Number one is that you have to really want it. You have to really want this. You can't be here because your spouse told you. You go in there and you get deliverance so you're out of here. 
or you can't be a teenager and come in because your parents said, you go get deliverance so I'm going to kick you out of the house. That doesn't work because they don't even really want to be here. But if you truly, truly are sick and tired of the devil, you know, there comes a point in your life where you're just tired of being tired. You know, it's like the devil's been chasing you. And as long as you run from the devil, he's going to chase you. When it comes a point in your life where you draw the line and you stop running and you turn around and you say, Devil, you've been messing with me. Now I'm going to mess with you for a while. And you start chasing him. Believe me, they put on their tennis shoes and run. They are scared to death of a Christian that realizes that the God inside of them has all power over the devil. Most people are afraid of the devil. That's crazy. You know you got God inside of you. There is no, the only part of you the devil can have is the part that you give him. That's all. And when you turn around and you say, devil, I'm tired. I'm tired of being depressed. You've been stealing my joy. I am sick to death of it. And I'm going to do something about it. They are afraid of you. And they will run. Now, have you noticed that the average Christian, maybe not in your church, but the average Christian across the world doesn't have the victory? How many of you know people that have the victory? You know, most Christians, they're up one day and they're down the next. Up one day and down the next. They're like a yo-yo, up and down, up and down, up and down. And you know, the secular world is looking at us. And you know what? They want to see something solid. They want to see something all together. They look at us and we're up and down and up and down. And they, they say, you know what? Why do I want anything to do with that Christianity? What's it doing for them? So it's not a good witness to have this up and down, in and out thing. You need to be solid. You need to have it all together. Um, I think the reason that you don't have Christians getting the victory is because you don't have that many churches teaching spiritual warfare. And that's sad. Uh, something happened, I think, about 30 years ago. And there was a movement in the church of spiritual warfare and deliverance. And it got perverted. I mean, people got weird. They got way, you know, like a pendulum is here. They were way down on this end of the pendulum. And like if you sneeze, they said you had a devil. All these kind of craziness things that were going on. And I think that was the greatest tool that Satan has ever used because he got people scared of deliverance, and especially pastors. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They're scared to death. They're scared of the unknown. And uh, I think that was his greatest tool. He took it and let it, you know, um, move through the body of Christ, and then he perverted it. Well, um, let me tell you something. We are in a battle every day of our life. My Bible tells me that the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the only job they have. Kill, steal, and destroy. And guess what? They have seven days a week, 24 hours a day to do just that. And they're assigned to you. We don't have 24 hours a day to fight back. We got to sleep and eat and do dishes and take kids here and do all, work and do all of these kind of things. But they're working against you all the time. Uh, how many demon angels are there? Demon spirits. How many are there? There's one third of a countless number. Now that's a bunch. And they're all here. And guess what? You're their target. They, the rest of the world they already got. They want to pull you down, destroy you. And, and when you start seeing things, it just makes, when you look back on your life and you see what the devil's done to you, it makes you so fighting mad. You just really want to get him for what he, the, the years that he's stolen from you. Um, that, that nobody's teaching it. So I'm just hoping that when you're here this weekend, 
you're going to learn some things and you're going to help your friends and your family with the things that you've learned here. Uh, if you were a coach, I'm going to pick on uh, Bruce back there because I know Bruce's name. Let's say Bruce was um, a football coach and he's very, very good at what he does. What he would do is probably get a video of that team, opposing team, playing someone else. And he'll get his team together and watch it. And he'll say, look, look, there's a weak spot. We're going to get them right there. But even in the secular world, people study their enemy. In, in the wartime, they even know what the enemy's having for lunch and they know where they're having it at. But you know, we as Christians, we're just out here in la-la land when it comes to the devil. Most of us don't even know we're in a war. And if we did, they, we wouldn't even know who the enemy was. And if we did know even who the enemy was, we wouldn't know how to fight back. So see how important spiritual warfare is. Uh, this morning, before you even woke up, the devil had a plan for your life. You may be, uh, uh, I'll just pick you, pick on you for example. Let's say that yesterday they tried fear and it didn't work. So today, before you ever even woke up, they have a plan for your life, maybe for rejection. And they're going to get this person to reject you and that person and that person. You see, there is a plan set before you even wake up in the morning. It's like this. It's like before deliverance, we're like a computer. And the devil just plays with you all day long. But he can put a thought into your mind. Okay, he hits fear and up jumps all these thoughts about fear. See, he's been there all your life. He knows all these memories. He hits rejection. Up comes rejection. You see, he can do this to you. Play, just playing games with you. He can do it every day till you come get so depressed that you even maybe want to commit suicide. Just playing you like a computer. But after deliverance, it's like you're a cash register. He, put, he puts uh, his finger on fear. He pushes that button and up jumps no sale. And he goes over here and he hits uh, rejection, up jumps no sale. Because you see, the memory is still there. But the sting of the memory is gone. And that's how it works. Now, how... <clears throat> uh, if you've been around church any time at all, you know that we're like three people in one. We're body, soul, and spirit. Okay, over here, your spirit man. The minute that you accepted Christ as your Savior, swish, you got a new spirit man. He's right in here. And you know what? He's okay. He's sealed. Your spirit man is fine. So we're just going to kind of like take him and put him off over here because we are not going to deal with your spirit man this weekend. We're going to have nothing to do with him because he's okay. <clears throat> now over here, you got your soul. Your soul has got a lot of problems. We all have problems in our soulish area because that's the part of us Satan can get to. It's your mind, your emotions, and your will. Every memory that you have is right up, you know, Satan has access to that. It's your mind. He can put those thoughts. He can remind you of those things that happen. And your emotions, how you feel about people and things, he has access to that. Okay? Now, over here, you got your body, man. Now, we all look a little bit different. But, you know, a lot of churches are teaching. When you get born again, everything gets born again. Body, soul, and spirit. And I will give anything in the world if it were true. But it's not true. Let's say in your body man over here, you got a cancer right here on your arm. Okay, over here you accept Jesus and swish, you got a new spirit man. But over here in your body, you still got that cancer on your arm. 
you see, you're a prime candidate for healing, but you, your body parts didn't get born again. Guess what? Neither did your soul, neither did your memories, and neither did your emotions. So what we're going to do this weekend is clean out this part. And I'm telling you, your life will never be the same. There's things in your soulish area that it's like it's a rope around your um, your spirit man and it's holding him back from being all God wants you to be. Maybe over here in the soulish area you got fear. So you don't want to go out and tell anyone about Jesus. You don't want to witness. You see that fear in your soul is holding back the call of God on your life or your spirit man in your life. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's like a residue. And when we get this cleaned out, you can mature more in the Lord in two weeks than some people have in 40 years. It is amazing what's going to happen to you. You, you We want. That's what we want to do. Get everything, and, and that's what these um, homework assignments are going to do. It's going to close up these doors so we can get rid of It's like a residue. You know, we have a lot of pastors that come here. Pastors come here from all over the nation, and they have problems. Pastors have the biggest problems, and I'll explain to you why. Let's say that the man is uh, 20 years old and he gets born again. And man, he loves God with all his heart. And he goes off to Bible college. And he comes back and he's a preacher. Now, before he got born again, who knows what he was into. Maybe he was into a lot of lust and perversion. Okay? Now, it never he never got deliverance from it. It's still there. The more he built up his spirit man, the more it pushed it down. But he comes back and he's out. We've had, we've had pastors tell us this, that they're standing up there preaching and man, they just want so much to get that sermon across and, and read the scriptures right and everything. And they say, but maybe, you know, there's a girl on the front row with the shortest little skirt you ever saw and there's nothing but legs over there. And he says, I, as much as I want to to, to preach, my eyes keep going over to the legs. You see, a lot of preachers, they are just coping. And it takes all their energies not to do this thing that is driving them. Let's say, and we've had pastors that were into homosexuality and all kinds of stuff before they got born again. They get born again and they're still fighting these feelings because it is never, they've never kicked the devil out of that area in your soulish area. We've had other pastors that come in and they say, well, they were into a lot of fighting. A lot of hatred and bitterness and revenge and retaliation. It, it, I mean, for if you could hear the stories we have about p what parents do to kids, it's just unbelievable. A lot of them, they just hate their dad so bad that they have all this revenge and retaliation. And maybe they fought. Maybe they fought in bars, you know, before they got born again. But they get born again. They love God. They go off to Bible college and they come back and they still have this anger and this bitterness. And guess what they do? Most of them beat up on their wives and kids. And those wives and kids can't tell anybody. If they do, daddy loses his job. And they get the blunt end of it. Do you see what I'm saying? And not only that, it hurts them spiritually because this man is the head of the church and is, you know, it's their spiritual head. And they see this, it hurts them physically, it hurts them spiritually. And all the man needs is just deliverance. It makes all the difference. So we have a problem in our solely shared. We all do. Because we didn't get born, born again. There were a few years there in all of our lives before we got born again. And you don't know what happened. A lot of times people don't even know what happened back when they were in diapers. Okay, now then, uh, let, let's talk for a minute. What caused the open doors in your life? And Paul's going to get into it a little bit more. But do you know, the, for all of you sitting here, you're going to be really shocked at this. But the, 
the biggest percent of what is your problem today is simply who you got born to. Now maybe you have wonderful mother and dad, but what about grandma and grandpa? What about great grandma and great grandpa? You know the Bible says it stands the fathers come down three or four generations. Most of us don't even know who our great great parents are, uh, grandparents are, or where they came from. And you know, in this area, we um, have a lot of witchcraft. You all know that, a lot of santeria. All these kinds of things are going on in this area. And we've really encountered a lot recently. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say that um, grandma took a man uh, away from his wife. Now, you don't know what that woman was into. You know, she could have been into all kinds of voodoo stuff and whatever and put curses on the family line. We see it all the time. Maybe it wasn't even her. Maybe she went home to her friends and relatives and said, you know what, that woman took my husband away. And, and maybe she wasn't even into it. But, and she walks out the door and leaves and her friends and relatives says, hmm, we'll fix, we'll fix her. And, and they put curses. You are the result of some sins that your forefathers have done. And in the deliverance, we break all of that. Every bit of it can be broken just so quickly. You're going to be glad you came here. This is going to be a really good weekend. Uh, familiar spirits. Familiar, we call them familiar because they're familiar with your bloodline. They know everything about you. I'll pick on Mary again. They, well, first of all, they know who in your family, they can get to uh, look at you a certain way, make you angry. Someone else can say a certain thing and make you feel rejected. They know this. They know how to get to you. And a demon spirit cannot get to you any other way but someone that's close to you. Let me give you an example. Let's take Mary. She goes out to get in the car tonight. And some little kids walk by the street down there and they say, Hey, Mary, I hate your gut. And Mary says, Huh, so big deal. And she gets in her car and goes home. But when she gets home, her daughter calls her up and said, I hate your guts. Well, <clears throat> that's like you put in the knife and twist it. You see, the devil knows that he can't get to you with the kid on the street. But he's going to get to you with someone close. And he knows who your boss is. He knows all your cousins and your uncles. He knows how to get to you. Now, um, there's, there's other, oh, let's say for an example, um, people die, but spirits don't. Let's say that you had, uh, um, someone in your, uh, ancestral line die and they have some demon spirits you know what those spirits don't stay two seconds with that dead body because a spirit can't do its dirty work in a dead body it's got to have a live warm body to do its dirty work and that quick when there's a death in your family that spirit goes somewhere that quick and it's going to go to wherever there's an open door it may not be your generation, it might be the one after you, but it, that quick, it's going to go into someone. I could, we didn't have time, I could tell you probably 300 stories right now of where that happened. Um, some of you were watching um, the video earlier. You saw on the video this one gal, and uh, she went to her grandmother's funeral, and that's when she picked up spirits of mental illness and that, and we ended up praying for her in the uh, mental hospital. And there was nothing wrong with her. The only thing is that she just picked up her grandmother's spirits. It's, it's amazing. Now then, I don't think they will ever change bloodlines. This is my personal opinion, because I think they're lazy. If they go over to someone else's bloodline, they got to learn all about them. And they already know everything about you. So just keep your doors closed. Another open door is like uh, sexual molestation. Let's say a little child is sexually molested. 
That's not their sin. It's the other guy's sin. But you know what? It opened up a door in that little child for lust and perversion. They didn't want it. They didn't ask for it. But they got it. Now, it might lay dormant if they're only three, four, or five years old. But when they get puberty age, that thing is going to come alive. And that person is going to get so promiscuous. And they don't know why. They don't even necessarily like what they're doing. But there is an inner drive in them to do this thing. You see, because that lust and perversion was deposited in them when they were just a little bitty child. Um, we, we see weekly, we see this happen. And you know what? That spirit, until you get rid of it, you're still, it's still going to bother you. Let's say, uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Let's say that you are uh, a little girl and you're sexually molested. Now that put that spirit there. Okay. You um, grow up and you're 30 years old, you're working and so forth, and you go to a meeting. Let's put you in a room of uh, 50 people. Within five minutes' time, you're going to be talking to someone and you just think you like their conversation. And they just think they like yours. You're kind of like drawn together. But there are things going on in the spirit realm that we can't see. There, You're going to be talking to someone that has molested a child. Chances are that has that spirit. Because they, that spirit that you can't see sees a spirit that they think they can feed off of. And they're drawing people together. A lot of times you're drawn to people because of the spirit thing within you. Let's say, I'll give you another example. Let's say that you have um, uh, control and manipulation. And I put you in a room of 50 people. And within a few minutes time, you are talking to someone. And you're just enjoying it and they're enjoying it. But you see, they have a spirit of timidity. Your spirit in you knows that if it can hook up with that person, you can control them and that is going to feed your spirit. I'll explain it a little bit better this way. The devil is only looking for a little nick in your armor. The devil doesn't usually come in like a flood. But think about it for a minute. Neither did your Holy Spirit. When God came into your life, you know what? You didn't know the Bible. You had to read it. Most most people had, didn't have any idea. They have to read the They feed their spirit. As they feed the spirit, it grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. At prayer, you pray and it feeds your spirit. Now see, you are feeding your Holy Spirit. But if the devil gets a little seed in here... He is going to make sure he feeds his spirit. You can count on it. He's going to water it and fertilize it and cultivate it because he's going to set you up. I'll give you an example. I was adopted. My parents didn't want me. They didn't even look at me when I got born. Now that gave, remember I told you Satan is a legalist? That gave Satan a, quote, legal right to put this little seed of rejection here. Every adopted child has rejection. Trust me on that. Okay, now this little seed is here. So he is now going to, once I'm born, set me up with this person and this person and this person to reject me. You know, when I was doing my homework assignment, the Lord showed me something that I would never, ever have remembered. It's kind of like... Sometimes it's a little teeny key that opens up a great big door. He showed me that, um, and, and then I remembered after he showed me I was in first grade. We had just moved from one town to another town at Christmas time. Now all the little girls had their clique. They were brownie scouts. Does anybody know what a brownie scout is? They wear little brown uniforms with a beanie and it's what you are before you're a Girl Scout. Well, all of them had their clique, and everybody in the world wants to be in the clique. And so I asked this one little girl, I said, um, 
how do you get to be a brownie scout? And she snubbed her nose up at me and said, well, you have to get voted on as if to say we would never vote on you. Now that I look back, I know that I know that I know it wasn't the little girls that didn't want me in their brownie scouts. It was the devil using those little girls to feed, water, and cultivate what he already got in there when I was in the womb. That's just exactly how the devil works. Let's say that um, they're hungry. They, they are hungry and they are going to use your body to eat. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. There's like an inner drive, an inner drive. If you have an inner drive to do anything, if you're doing something that you don't really want to do, you can suspect demonic activity. Now then, let's say that you have a spirit of gluttony and you're a housewife in your home doing your housework. And on your kitchen table is a carrot cake. It is your most favorite dessert in the whole wide world and oh you absolutely love that icing okay now you're running your sweeper and you're just going along sweeping the floor and there's something that's saying carrot cake carrot cake carrot cake and you say oh okay so you go in the kitchen and you have a little sliver you come back and you're doing your dusting you're dusting around here and there's something driving you crazy it's saying carrot cake carrot cake carrot cake and you go back and you have another little sliver now the end of the day comes, and the carrot cake's gone. In a million years, you did not mean to eat an entire carrot cake. But do you know, a spirit of gluttony is not one bit different than the cocaine addict. Your spirit of gluttony eats table food, and it is going to use your body to get what it wants. A cocaine addict, that drive, that spirit is driving and pushing that person to do the cocaine. Do you see bondage is bondage? Let me tell you one thing about bondage. You can overcome. Let's say you uh, are addicted to nicotine and you overcome on your own. Not without God, not without deliverance. You just do it. Okay, you just quit. It's like you put a cork under the water and boom, it shoots up over here wearing a different hat. Have you noticed that a lot of people when they quit smoking, they gain weight? Same old, same old. It's a same old devil wearing a different hat. Now it's getting you to eat food instead of nicotine. And if you go on a diet and you stop that, guess what? You're going to be into uh, marijuana, prescription drugs. It'll pop up somewhere else. Best thing to do, just get rid of the whole spirit, the whole spirit of bondage to start with. Now, um, let's say you have a lying spirit. Every teeny tiny little lie you tell, it grows. Every little deceitful word out of your mouth, that spirit gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You've met people that can't tell the truth. They lie so much they believe it. They have fed that spirit so many times that it's big and it's out of control. Remember Pinocchio? Every lie his nose got bigger. I guarantee if you got a lying spirit, every lie you tell is going to get bigger and bigger. Let's say that you have lust and perversion, okay? Now you can pick up that pornography book and you can look at it and guess what? The spirit will leave you alone for a while. You know what? Because you fed it. But that evening, maybe you're sitting there watching TV and you got your little clicker and you're clicking around the channels and you see this scene and they don't have much clothes on and you're in the bedroom and you pause your clicker and you're looking at that. And while you're looking at that, I guarantee you there is something down here saying, hey, thanks, I need a dinner. They are going to eat and they're going to use your body to do it. I love the way Benny Hinn puts it. Do y'all know who Benny Hinn is? Uh, an evangelist on uh, television. He said, I just wanted to smack that devil, but that woman's face was in the way. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit more about rejection. She talked to you a little bit about that. 
but uh, we find that rejection is a, uh, a spirit, we call it like a mother spirit. It's something that really opens doors for other spirits to come in. And as Claire had mentioned, it's a spirit that generally comes in when you're just a small child. Sometimes it'll come in before you're born, while you're in the womb. But that spirit of rejection will stay with you your whole life until it's kicked out. And if you've noticed that you've ever had anybody that's had that rejection, or maybe if you feel like you have that rejection, it seems like during different periods of your life, it seems like you're always being rejected. Uh, we've ministered to uh, people, counseled with people that have had that spirit of rejection uh, so strong. It's like uh, when they were just a little child, uh, the kids down the street didn't want to play with them. They would get into uh, grade school, and maybe the eighth grade school teacher or some teacher would embarrass them in front of a classroom. They get to be a teenager, and, they, and if it's a girl, they start dating a boyfriend, and that boyfriend, uh, they fall in love with the boyfriend, and all at once he decides he doesn't want to date them anymore. He wants to date her girlfriend. All right, more rejection. The rejection just keeps going, just keeps going. All right, your brothers or your sisters will reject you. You'll find that maybe a mother or father will reject you at different times while you're growing up. You get married, and uh, and all at once you finally feel like you've arrived. You have found a man of your dreams, and so you marry him. And all at once, after you've been married for a year or so, you find that he's not anything like you thought he was going to be. And so you find maybe down the line he's going to start stepping out on you, and uh, he's going to find him another woman that he's going to be running around with, and that's the ultimate rejection. And so that rejection just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You get a divorce from that husband, and uh, and so you're devastated. You get yourself kind of put back together, and after a year or two, you decide to, you meet someone else. You decide to marry that person. That person, it will repeat the same cycle because there's a spirit in these people that see the rejection in you. They don't know that, but it's in the unseen world that the spirits in them will see the spirit of rejection in you, and that spirit in them knows that they can feed off of that, and so, and, and so the rejection gets worse and worse and worse. When the rejection is there, we've noticed that it follows a channel. When, when a person has a spirit of rejection, it opens up a door for a spirit of despair, for a spirit of guilt, a spirit of grief, a spirit of self-pity, loneliness, depression, manic depression, and then suicide. You see, the end result is taking your own life, but the root of the whole problem is rejection. We have seen it follow another channel with other people. And uh, it's like the I get even spirit. The root is still rejection, but it'll open up a door for impatience, for bitterness, for revenge, retaliation, for anger, for hatred, for rage, wrath, and murder. The end result is death. Our prisons are full of them. All right? These are people that are just normal, just like we are. But because of a spirit of rejection that came into them when they were a small child, open up all these doors of bitterness and the, and the retaliation and the anger. And you know, when that spirit becomes alive in them and comes so strong, it will temporarily possess them. And the anger and the rage will become so strong, they'll go, they'll go out and they'll get in a fight. They'll, they'll get so mad at that person. They'll kill that person. The first thing you know, they're in prison. And they don't even remember doing what they did because that spirit took them over. And, and we've seen this happen so many people. It's just, but the root again is rejection. Rejection is a bad spirit, but, and, and it will open these doors up in a person's life. And I think a lot of you can probably relate to what I'm saying, but, uh, it's, but we can get free from that. And, and that spirit will have to stay in your life. You can, you can walk and have a life of freedom. You don't have to have rejection and all these things that we've just talked about. So uh, we want to see you absolutely free from all of these things. Amen? All right, now I want you to, to open up your manual to uh, uh, the first session. Uh, Bruce, you want to help me? I'm going to pass out the stronghold list. Now there's a, this list is in your manual under the first session. The reason I'm passing out an extra copy is because we want you to write on it. You may not want to write in your book. You can write in your book if you want to. Uh, we encourage you to do that, but uh, some of you may not want to do that, so I'm going to pass you out an extra one here. <clears throat> I want you to uh, just uh, take a look at some things here. The reason we give you the stronghold is this is to help you to identify some areas in your life
that might you may have some problems or you've had problems in the past. Now, the reason we do that is because Satan's kingdom is set up like an army. You've got the little uh, buck privates, you've got the sergeants and the, the, right on up the line. Okay, different levels of authority. Well, that's how King, Satan's kingdom is set up. And so the Bible says that if you bind the strong man, you spoil his house. Well, what are the strong men? Well, as we look through the scriptures, and as the Lord has shown us, every the things that we have listed here in the in the capital letters and the dark letters, we believe are strong men. Look at fear. Fear is in the top middle column. All right, there's a strong man of fear, and it's a ruling spirit over insecurity, inadequacy, inferiority complex, timidity, worry, sensitivity, and everything listed there. All right, phobias, anxiety, panic attacks procrastination. Can anybody identify with that? Anything there? All right. Okay, let's look at heaviness. Next one down. There's uh, there's gloominess, and then you see rejection. You see, we know that rejection has two strongholds over it. One is heaviness, and the other one is fear. All right? But in itself, it is a very powerful spirit. And But when the person has that, then you look underneath that. You see despair and grief and fatigue and guilt, self-pity, loneliness, depression, and so forth. Can anybody identify with anything there? All right. Okay. So you see there, there are issues here. And, and as you look at this, you're going to say, wow, man, I've got that. I've got this. I've got that. And then you keep looking at it and you say, well, I think I'll just circle the whole page. So what we want you to do is just take a good look at it. All right. Anything in your past that has been a characteristic, circle it. All right. If you have to circle the whole page, that's okay. We're going to pray for everything anyway. But but this is going to help you to identify areas in your life that really need to be dealt with. I like to explain it this way. It's like a school teacher comes into a classroom, and there's a ruckus on the back row. And the teacher looks at the back row and sees all that carrying on, and, and, uh, and he or she says, uh, all of you kids in the back row, I want you to come up here to the front. And you know what happens? Nothing. They just look at each other, all right? They try to put the blame on this person and that person, and nothing really happens. But if she comes into the classroom and she says, Johnny, you come up here. You know what happens? Johnny comes up there for two reasons. Number one, as a teacher, you have the authority. And number two, you identified him. This is why we're doing this. You see, we can, we can, uh, when we can see a, a person, we can talk to a person, and, and if a person, if I'm praying for our brother here, what's your name? James. James. If I'm praying for James, and all at once, uh, I'll just say, James, I'll just, I'll pray for him, and I said, you spirit in him, in the name of Jesus, you come out of him. Well, there's nothing's going to happen, because I didn't identify the spirit. But I said, if you spirit of fear in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. And I said, you come out of this person in the name of Jesus. You know what? Fear will leave. If it doesn't have a right to stay, it will go. Because the authority is here. You see, we know that we have the authority. Jesus has given us that authority. When he walked upon the face of the earth 2,000 years ago, one-third of his ministry was deliverance. And you know, when he showed up, the demons manifested because the anointing that was upon his life. And he, and, and all he had to do is speak a word. And those spirits left him. And all the, all the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and every kind of other sea that was running around there, they thought, well, you know, this man just speaks a word and they have to leave. Well, see, Jesus had the authority. And they didn't have that authority. But, you know, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave us that authority. He says, I'm going to give this to you people, the body of Christ, because you can step on snakes and scorpions, and there's nothing in the demonic kingdom that will hurt you, and you will have the power and authority that you need to come against the demonic kingdom. He has given us that authority. Most Christians don't realize they have that authority. You see, but also Satan has legal rights. He knows the word of God. And he knows when anybody has trespassed against the word of God, he said, "Uh uh-huh, I've got an open door. Now I'd like for you to get out your uh, open door list. That's on page 10 in your manual. Uh, Bruce, you might want to help me uh, work on this as well. Uh, Pass these out to everyone. Uh, We do that because uh, you want to write on these, and you may want to use the uh, ones in your uh, workbook to run copies off of. So if you want to work with your friends, 
and people and deliverance, then you've got something to work with. The first one there has to do with unforgiveness. What we're asking you to do here is to list all the people from your childhood uh, up to the present time whom you had or have had or ever have had any unforgiveness or resentment toward any person. Whether that person's dead or alive, it makes no difference. All the way back to childhood, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. We always recommend that you pray before you start working on your open door list. But this is a uh, uh, opportunity for you to really go back to as far as you can and start seeing any area where there's been unforgiveness because at that time when that was in, in your life, that opened up a door, and it could be a door of uh, demonic influence in your life, and we want to deal with every issue. We realize that today you may have already forgiven these people. Every Christian, we know they do forgive. They're taught to forgive. But uh, if you had some unforgiveness when you were 16 years old, and that really was a, a very difficult time of your life, you had a resentment toward a certain person, then that particular time could open up a door for bitterness, could open up a door for insecurity in your life. And once a devil comes in, he doesn't leave just because you become born again. We have to kick him out. And that's what we're going to do. But first we need to identify every open door so that uh, we know exactly what issues we need to deal with. We had a lady that came to see us one time. It's been uh, several years ago, but she was in her mid-40s. She could not sleep in a bed that was uh, where the bed was next to the wall in the bedroom. She had to sleep with her light on. She had tremendous amount of insecurity, inadequacy, a lot of fear, a lot of phobic fear. And her life was going into a state of depression, and uh, she was having suicidal thoughts because of all of this uh, rejection that had come upon her. And so she came in for deliverance. When she started doing her homework, she prayed, and she asked God to show her open doors all the way back to childhood. She could not remember past the age of six, so that in itself we thought was a red flag, but... Uh, uh, when she was praying, the Lord showed her when she was approximately three to four years of age, she was on a bed. The bed was sitting uh, next to the wall in her bedroom. Her father was in a fit of rage, and he had come into that bedroom, and he was uh, just uh, out of control, beating her with a belt and really putting a, a child abuse upon her. And, and so that opened up a door in her life at that point for rejection, insecurity, inadequacy, a tremendous amount of fear. And even though she's been living her whole life, that opened up that door. And those spirits were still tormenting her to the point to where they were trying to put her in a complete depression with suicidal thoughts. She forgave her father. And, of course, when we then prayed for her, she was completely set free. And so she dealt with the open doors that had allowed those spirits in. Uh, we want you to do this all the way back to childhood. No matter what the person has done to you, it could have been a, someone that uh, uh, could have mistreated you as a child. could have been an uncle, an aunt. could have been a child. It could have been a brother or sister. It could have been a school teacher that embarrassed you in front of a classroom. It could uh, be uh, anyone at all that has really messed up your life. Maybe you loan money to somebody and they never paid you back. Anything that God shows you where you had unforgiveness or resentment towards someone, just write that person's name down. If you can't remember a name, then somehow try to identify it by the location or the time span in your life so that uh, you can at least make some kind of a point of that. The, the material that's on this particular page, the space that's available for you, uh, may not be enough. You may have to get another sheet of paper. That's fine. But uh, we just want to make sure you deal with every issue. The second thing we've listed is the occult. We want you to write down anything that you've ever done in the occult. Uh, this could be uh, uh, just horoscopes. Maybe you played with a Ouija board when you was a child. Uh, it could be uh, anything that you've done with New Age, superstition. Maybe you got into witchcraft. You uh, uh, could be uh, different types of uh, uh, spirits of divination could have come in through Santeria or in the roots or anything at all that you could have gotten yourself involved in, seances, meditation, etc. 
Anything at all that you've ever done in the occult, we just ask you to write it down because uh, we need to uh, have you do a proclamation for that, and we'll show you what to do with that uh, in our session number two. But uh, these are very important. Also, you might list some issues that you feel like could be some generation curses that have come upon your life. Uh, many times you need to ask your parents for these inf this information. But if you find that grandmother had migraine headaches, your mother had migraine headaches, you're having migraine headaches, and now it's going down into your children, you realize that that's a spirit of infirmity. That's a generational curse, and you can be set free from that instantly. But uh, we need to identify these things. Lots of infirmities come down through the inherited bloodline. And so uh, uh, we want to uh, deal with every issue. Uh, I had a spirit of infirmity that's upon me that was a generational curse. My grandfather died when my father was 12 years old. My grandfather died of a congestion in his lungs. It turned into pneumonia, and it killed him. My father, at only at 12 years of age, uh, also he had a problem of sinus drainage. That problem uh, caused his nose to drip, and I'll always remember that when the weather would change, that would increase the drainage, and uh, his nose would drip. He would be ministering in church, and he would uh, have a microphone in one hand. He'd have a uh, he'd have a handkerchief in the other. My dad was always wiping his nose. I didn't think much about it, but you know, I had a problem. I had a drainage in the back of my throat. My nose did drip, but there was a drainage, continuous drainage in my throat. And when the weather would change very little, it would increase it to the point if I didn't get an antihistamine or an antibiotic in my system within 24 hours, I would have laryngitis for maybe three or four days. And it would put me up and I couldn't uh, talk, couldn't do anything. And uh, it was miserable. It was an allergy problem. And I've gone to doctors. I've had it checked out. I've had medication for it. And the medication made me feel worse. So I just quit taking medication. And, uh, and it was just something I had to live with all my life, it seemed like. Approximately six to seven years ago, we were at Rodney Howard Brown Crusade at the Carpenter's Home Church in Lakeland, Florida. And uh, we were coming home about one o'clock in the morning from a very powerful anointed service. As we were driving down I-4 toward Tampa, the Lord spoke to me, and it was almost an audible voice. It was so strong in my mind. And it says, you need to break an ungodly soul tie between you and your father. Now, my father had already passed away. But uh, I thought, well, this can't be from God because I don't have anything ungodly between my dad and I. My father was a, one of the most godly men that I've ever met, that I ever knew. And uh, he, I didn't think, ever had any sin in his life at all. I had a good childhood. I had a tremendous relationship with both my mother and father. As I grew up, so I could, how could I have an ungodly soul tie? About three or four minutes later, the Lord spoke to me again. He says, if you'll break that ungodly soul tie between you and your father, I will heal you of your sinuses right now. Well, I turned to my wife and she got the oil out of her purse. She always carries anointing oil with her and she anoints me with oil. I'm still driving down I-4 and, uh, I just spoke it out. I just said, in the name of Jesus, I break every ungodly soul tie between myself and my father. And my father and myself, I put a Jesus bloodline between us. I said, Saint, in you and your kingdom, you'll never cross this bloodline again. And you spirit of infirmity, you spirit of sinuses that came into me through my dad. I said, in the name of Jesus, you come out of me right now. Well, I felt something go right out of the top of my head. And through my fingertips as I was hanging on to the steering wheel. And all at once, my sinuses dried up. And I can tell you, I've never had that type of a problem since. My sinus, were, I was set free. And I've never had that type of a problem. God set me free. It was just because it was a generational curse that came upon me through the inherited bloodline. And God set me free from it. And he'll set you free. No matter what the infirmity is. If there's a generation curse upon your life. Uh, if you know of one, write it on that sheet of paper right there, and uh, we'll deal with that when we, when we come to that issue and when we pray. Many women have miscarriages. Uh, it's a generational thing. The addictions also come down through the inherited bloodline. If grandfather was addicted to alcohol, then sometimes that addiction will flow down, and it could be alcoholism. 
It's an addiction, or it could be drugs. It could be nicotine. Whatever that is, that's usually from a generational curse that comes through the inherited bloodline. Many times some of you have had words spoken over you, words that were spoken over you by your father, saying you'll never mount to anything. You won't mount to a hill of beans. You won't, uh, you'll never be successful. You're going to always be sick. That could have come from a doctor. And you know what? These are cursing words. If you know of any cursing words that's been spoken over your life as a child or even uh, in the recent days, uh, write that down. We're going to break the curse of those words so they will no longer have an effect upon your life and you can be set free from that. Because words are powerful and we want to be set free from every negative word the devil has put in somebody's mouth to try to influence our lives. Number three has to do with sexual sin. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 that says, When a man came together with a harlot, he became bonded with her. Now that bonding was not for a short period of time. That bonding was for life. That created an ungodly soul tie between that man and that harlot. Any spirit in that person had a legal right to transfer into the other person. An ungodly soul tie is a legal channel that is established and spirits can flow through uh, these channels. God wants us to be set free from those. So what we're asking you to do is to list everything that you've ever, any relationship you've ever had, sexual relationship outside of the marriage vows, all the way back as far as you can remember. Now, first of all, let me say this, that this open door list is a private list. No one's going to ever look at it. We don't look at it, and we highly recommend that husbands and wives, you do not allow each other to look at your list. It's not important because it's all under the blood anyway. It's only important that you do that because if there has been a demonic influence in your life because of these ungodly soul ties, we need to deal with them, and we need to, you need to be set free from them. So we're going to show you how to deal with them, and uh, you deal with them on your own. We had a lady come in one time that had been into witchcraft very heavily. She was also into prostitution. And when she came in and we explained this to her, she said, Oh, no, you don't have to explain that to me. I know all about that. I've been with hundreds of men. She said, I'm not proud of it anymore at all, because uh, I now love Jesus and he's living in my life. But she says, when I was on the streets, and I was also in witchcraft, uh, every man that I was with, I would put 15 to, de- 15 to 20 demons in every one of them. And she said, they had no idea what they got from me. But she said, I knew, I know about transfer of spirits, and I know that I had a legal right to do that, and I did it. And they went home with a lot more than they thought they did. We had, uh, was, was listening to a man that's been in this ministry for years, probably for over 25 years, a tremendous man of God, a man that God has called into the deliverance ministry. His name is Peter Horvin. He's from England. He was telling us one time that he was in a church ministering, teaching them about sexual sin. And it was a small group. But at the end of his teaching, he was giving the closing prayer. And it was as he was praying, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, gave him a word of knowledge and said that someone there had committed sexual sin 17 years ago. And I want you to come, have him come up here because I want to heal him. After the prayer, he said, made that comment. And uh, he said, someone here has committed sexual sin 17 years ago. And if you'll come up here to the front, God said he'll heal you. A lady comes up. And as she came up, she said, I believe that I'm the one that you had the word of knowledge on because 17 years ago, I did commit sexual sin. But she said, it's not what you think. It was with my husband. 17 years ago, she said, neither I or my husband have ever had any other sexual partners. And we have not had that even after marriage. She said, we have been very faithful to each other. I believe he was like an elder in the church. He was a Sunday school teacher. They were very godly people. But she said 17 years ago, three months before we got married, we decided it would be okay for us to go ahead and have some sexual relationships because he was going to get married anyway. And so 
that is a sin that I committed. And so he said, well, let me have you go through a proclamation. He read, he led her through a proclamation that confessed from what she did before marriage was sin and uh, asked God to forgive her. He said, one other thing. He said, let me say one other thing. Let's do this. He said, uh, let me pray with you. And he says, now I break the ungodly soul tie that's between you and your husband and your husband and you. And as he broke the ungodly soul tie, he said, now you spirit of darkness that entered her through that ungodly soul tie in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her right now. She went down on the floor. She had a grand mal epileptic fit in front of him. Now he didn't know she was an epileptic. God said he just wanted to heal her. About four or five minutes later, she gets off the floor. She raises her hand. She said, praise God, I'm healed. And he says, well, praise God. But he said, uh, please explain to me what's going on. And uh, she said, well, before I got married, she said, I never had a seizure. But after I got married, about three or four weeks, I had a little seizure. And she said, every month I would have another one. And these seizures were small at first. But she said, as the years went on, they got bigger and bigger. The last three years, I have been on the highest dosage of medication I can possibly be on. And she says, I have three, I have two of these a month. And every time I have one, she says, I'm so depressed, I have to go into a dark room for two days. I read the Bible. I pray. It takes me two days to break out of it. And for the months is over, I'll have another one. She said, I've just had one here in front of you. And she says, I am not depressed. I know God has set me free. And he got a letter from her. Six months later, she said, I've taken no more medication, and I've been totally, I have, have never had another seizure. I've been totally healed by the power of God. Well, that was an open door that she had opened up because of sexual sin, even if it was with her own husband. But God wants us to be completely free of anything that the enemy has had access into our lives. So we're just asking you to pray, and God will show you Every person, some of you may have been with so many people that uh, you can't remember all of them. But I can promise you, if you pray, the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit has a good memory. And he will remind you of, of every one that needs to be reminded of. And I would also just include anyone else that you can't even remember. But just, uh, but just begin to make a list. If you can't remember a person's name, try to identify the time period or the location whereabouts it took place the fourth has to do with soul ties what we need for you to do here is to list any person dead or alive that you may have had an ungodly soul tie with or maybe they had control over you now i would also include your mothers and fathers any brothers and sisters or any stepmother stepfathers i would definitely include that uh include uh, even grandparents, maybe a boss or someone that uh, maybe had a lot of control over you. Uh, some of you maybe uh, have gotten into some meditation and invited in spirit guides. You need to list that because as many times you will give them a name and uh, we need to deal with those issues. Some of you may have had abortions. Write down any person, any abortion that you've had and also the, the partner that helped create that abortion. Uh, some of you may have gone into hypnosis. You've been hypnotized by certain people. Try to write down the doctor, psychiatrist that may have done that, uh, done that to you, or maybe another type of person. And, uh, and I would also include ex-spouses, brothers and sisters, half-brothers, half-sisters, your children. And, uh, and also just, uh, anybody that the God shows you. Anybody that can push your button, write them down. Because these uh, obviously could be ungodly soul ties. Number five has to do with covenants and vows that have been broken. And this is primarily for people that have gone through divorces. You need to write that down. Also for people that have had uh, gone through bankruptcies. Uh, you need to list down those people that you had listed on your bankruptcy papers. And some of you that might be quite a long list. But this really does open up a door of poverty in your life when uh, you have uh, made a vow or a commitment to pay someone 
some money back, but you never did that. And uh, this doesn't mean you have to do that, but it means that we need to go through a, 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 pr a proclamation to release that off of our lives so that a spirit of poverty cannot be upon us. Number six has to do with pride. Anything that you could be prideful of in your life. Uh, maybe you feel like you have a better marriage than someone else. Maybe you, you feel like your ministry is better than the next person. You're, you're a better, have a better profession, a job. Maybe you know Bible scriptures better than anyone else. It makes no difference what the pride is. Pride is pride. And so uh, anything that you feel like there could be pride in your life, just write that down, and uh, we'll show you how to deal with that. Uh, next has to do with idolatry. Uh, anything at all that would stand between you and God. This could be your spouse. It could be your home. It could be your job, position, money, recreation, sports. Uh, it could be your children. It could be your ministry. Anything at all that is between you and God. We want you to write that down, and that's idolatry. And number eight has to do with any unconfessed sin. Many times people will are born again, but uh, ten years ago, but to, but today there's a little private sin, and maybe they a little lie, they're living a little gossip. Maybe they cheated someone. Maybe uh, they got into masturbation or something of this nature. It's just a private sin. But if there's anything like this in your life, just write it down because uh, we want you to be set free from that as well. You see, these are all open doors that have happened all the way back to childhood. And God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free not just so that you can live a life of freedom, but God realizes that you're in bondage. And the more bondage that you're in, the less he can use you. God wants us to have a life that can be absolutely free. When we're free, then we are free to worship him. And we can worship him so much better because we have all of this garbage cleaned out of our soulish area. You see, all of this stuff is just holding you back from reading the word of God. It's holding you back from worshiping the Lord. It puts you into bondage. It puts you in depression. And all through your life, you're trying to just cope with all these demonic spirits that's just been stirring you up and just been living inside of you. These are strongholds. And God wants you set free from that. Because after you get free, I can tell you, you love Jesus so much more. You have so much more clarity. And you can your life begins to be filled with the power of God, with the holiness that's inside of Jesus that comes inside of you. God wants us to live a victorious life and become militant for him. You can't be a wounded soldier and be any good to Jesus. Jesus wants you to be free. In the army, when a soldier gets wounded, they take him off the front lines. They take him back into a hospital to try to get him healed. That's what this is here. We're a spiritual hospital. And we want every person here to be absolutely free of demonic power so that there's nothing in Satan's kingdom that can have anything in your life. And I'll tell you what you'll experience as you're being set free. It just allows more of the light of Jesus to come into you. And the more of his light that comes into you, the more love that comes into you. Because it's a love of Jesus. Jesus wants you to have so much love for him and love for other people that you can do what he did when he walked the face of this earth. He was our example. He loved the people. He loved the people and he hated the devil. And God wants us to love each other. He wants us to love him. Because as we love him, then all at once then he can begin to use us in that same power that flowed through Jesus when he walked upon this earth with the same power that will flow through you. Because God wants us to be free and he wants to use us in these last days so that his power can flow through us and we can become mighty in his kingdom and we can come against the devil in his kingdom and so that there is nothing in Satan's kingdom that can come against us, but we will be militant to drive out any darkness that could be in our household. 
or that could be in our families or the person that we work with at work. You can become a powerhouse for Jesus and Jesus can work in your life. And I tell you, God wants you to be free. And we want you to be free. And you can be free. It makes no difference what you have. You can have, you can have depression to the point of suicide, but God can absolutely set you free. You can become so involved in the occult and Satanism that you think there's no way out. But I can promise you, God will set you free. He'll set you free. There can be an infirmity in your body that the doctor said there's no hope for you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus can do anything. There is no infirmity that he can't, he can't deal with. He created you, and he can fix you up. And in many cases, there's a spirit behind that disease, and, that, and I can promise you, you can be set free. And many people we've see, seen set free instantly. They've had pain all their life. Can't hardly deal with the pain. God sets them free just like that. Because there was maybe some bitterness that opened the door for that spirit to start working their life. Arthritis, yeah. You can be absolutely free from that. That journey comes in because of unforgiveness or resentment you've had towards someone or maybe you've held a judgment against someone. But God can set you free from it. And God wants you to be free. We're just asking you to do this homework. This is the first step. And make sure that every door that you may have, we get it exposed so that we can know how to close the doors. And in session number two, we will show you how to close every door. And we pray not only will you get set free, but these devils don't have any legal right to come back in your life. And you can continually walk in freedom. And you can be a powerhouse for Jesus. Glory be to God. Let's give him praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord.